Good evening, and welcome to the CAA's Columbia at Home series. We are so glad that you joined us tonight. My name is Patrick McGuire, and I am a TC alum and a member of the CAA program committee. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome back members of the Columbia Career Coaches Network for a new program on negotiating your career. After the panel discussion, we will have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We will try to respond to as many questions as we can in the time that we have. The panel tonight will be moderated by Eric Horowitz. Eric is a graduate of Columbia College class of 1990 and currently serves as the head coach for the Columbia Career Coaches Network. As a coach, his focus is helping executives design a career and a life plan that maximizes their strengths and identities. And now I am pleased to welcome Eric Horowitz to Columbia at Home. Eric? Thank you very much, Patrick, and uh, I'm glad everyone was able to join today. We have an illustrious panel of coaches that you're going to be able to get to meet and learn from, and we'll be talking about this hot topic. So first, I wanted to uh, uh, introduce Lenore Cantor, and Lenore, hopefully you can tell us uh, all about yourself. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Lenore Cantor, and I'm a transformational coach. I work with high achievers around finding more heart-driven success by being authentic. I support both individuals and organizations in aligning what they believe in and their plans with um, how they uh, actually show up in their brand so they can really create things on their own terms that are in uh, alignment with what they believe in. Amazing. Thank you, Lenore. Uh, next, uh, Sasha McDowell. Can you hear me? Yeah. All righty. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Sasha McDowell. I run a business called Epicycle Group, and I work with purpose-driven leaders with a focus on women and working parents so they can feel successful in their careers and also with their families and personally. So I work with individuals and in organizations, and I focus on leadership growth and development. I support career changers, job search, and I also work with business owners. And then I also offer programs for women. Thank you very much, Sasha. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, Mandy Tang, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Eric. So hi, everyone. I'm Mandy, and I run a coaching company called Rose Gold Careers. And the question that um, I'm pretty obsessed with working with my clients on is really understanding what you want your relationship to work uh, to be. And that can be a tactical question. That can also be a spiritual question. Um, so I do everything from, you know, helping people with like the application part of resumes and LinkedIn all the way through to really sitting with deeply, you know, what your purpose is um, and, and how you can find that and align that with your work. So excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So here's your wonderful coaches. We're going to have a great conversation. What I just to set the framing of what we're talking about today, we're talking about navigating and negotiating your career in our uh, post, half post COVID uh, existence. And uh, I was personally a Columbia economics major at Columbia and I didn't, uh, I, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I was always very interested in its practical application. One of the things that we learned in economics, one of my economic class was that labor supply was based on people's willingness to either work or to have leisure so they could either work or they could have leisure and it was balancing out those two things that would really basically figure out what the wage rate was um so in between the time that i did that in uh 1989 1990 
several factors have changed in terms of how the labor market works. So for example, we've had te significant technology changes, the, the role of families and parents and children and working from home and working remotely and the supply chain and then the ability to find labor all over the globe. So remember, simplistically, it's between leisure time and work time. And yet, over this time, there have been like a bazillion additional factors, okay? And within that, wages also, at one point, where you got a salary, and that was it. You either got paid an hourly wage or not. Also, over the last 30, 40 years, we have your salary, your bonus, your, your stock options, your vacation time your whether you're gonna work from home or whether you're gonna work remotely. So also within all this time, we have so many more ways in which to navigate your career, to think about what are all the factors that are involved in making these types of decisions. It can be a bit overwhelming. Hence, working with a coach is often a great way to break down all these things. So what we wanted to really cover today was Post COVID, actually, the options for employers and employees have multiplied even more with the fact that we can all work way more in way many different ways. So um, that's some of a framing of why it's important to be very conscious and conscientious about making these decisions because they're not so binary as they used to be. So uh, with that in mind, um, I'll start with you, Lenore. I thought maybe you could give either some examples, some tips about the ways people can think about these things uh, in navigating their career during this uh, interesting new time. Yeah, what I would say is, I think there are a few things you wanna know is first yourself and what you care about. So that should be one of the most important uh, guiding principles in any choice that you make. Second, you need to know the job that you're doing and what those requirements are. And then finally, you need to know the industry that you're in, right? Because those different variables will let you know how much flexibility you have in terms of um, negotiating salary and, and how much leverage you have as an individual versus what you're company or potential employers might require. So I'll just give a very simple example. I came out of the financial services industry where I worked for over 20 years. And while I know there are many um, financial companies that are supporting work from home, there are certain companies and certain industries that are very traditional. And they believe that if we can't see people, we don't. how do we know that they're not you know, messing around. So there are some businesses that are going to require you to be in the office, you know, that you need to know if that's the way the company that you're interested in or the industry that you're, you're pursuing, um, what they value and what they expect, it might be hard to um, create something that's different from that. So I would say, what you want to keep in mind is what is most important for you. So I'll just give you another example. I worked with um, a recent graduate who went into the publishing field and she had a master's and she thought that she would really be eligible to have a higher starting salary given she had this advanced degree. And what she was told was, you're a great candidate. She had been in the job for part-time and they extended an offer full-time, but this is the salary. So she had virtually no negotiating room because that's what that industry was paying for that job. Now, in some cases, you know, if there's a huge de demand and it's a competitive market and you're incredibly desirable, you may have more leverage. So just keep those things in mind and um, I guess I will just leave it at that. There are a lot of dynamics at play right now. Um, there is something to be said for staying at a company for a while, if that makes sense for you. However, I know that some people have gotten burnt out and are um, seeing reduced 
salary or benefits or other things from staying where they are. So I know it can be scary to think about making a change. So only you are going to know what is the right choice for you. But um, considering different variables, there are no hard and fast rules now. I think uh, you need to keep in mind what it is that's most important to you. Do you need the benefits and the salary? Um, is a bonus important? Do you want the stability, right? All of those things should factor into any choices that you make about your career. Uh, Lenore, can I ask you a question? Yes. So do you think that people get confused about their options because they talk to people or friends who are in different industries? I think it can be very easy to compare ourselves to what our peers are doing, but I think that's actually misleading and does us a disservice. Why? Because we don't know the full story. Um, people are motivated by different things, and I think it's we're best served by looking within about what we need and what's going to make us happy. Um, I have another client. We've been going through this process. She's in a seemingly great job. She's gotten promoted. Lots of, you know, she's managing people. She is stressed out beyond belief, right? It's a very competitive environment and she's not really happy. And the culture of the company she's in is not allowing her to set boundaries around her work and take care of her of her own mental health needs. Mm. And so now she gets to choose, do I stay at the cost of myself or do I look outside and um, go, you know, maybe from this company to another company or do I switch industries altogether because this particular business that I'm in is not in alignment with what I need for um, what I what's going to make me happy. So I think the more we compare ourselves to other people and compete with them, we're sort of um, taking away our own power in ways that can um, create more stress and anxiety in a job search that can already be a stressful thing to undergo. Uh, thank you, Lenore. So, so from that, I really hear like there are all these options, but knowing yourself is almost like that's step one. Yes, I believe that. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you. Okay, Sasha, what do you have to tell us? All right. Um, so I work a lot with women leaders and parents, so I'm going to kind of approach it a little bit from that angle. Um, so I think flexibility has been important to women and parents for a long time, and we've all, but we haven't always been able to get it. So we've just been through a year and a half of working from home. We all know it's possible. Um, the post COVID, what are we in? I, I see us as really in a transition time. And I think we're gonna be carving out new norms. And I think we're at the beginning of that transition. And I think it's gonna take some employers are already on board with flexibility, right? They, at the beginning of the pandemic, they were saying, this works, you decide how often you come in sort of for the end of time. Obviously we see other employers who are like, nope, you're vaccinated back in the office five days a week. But I think that over the next few years, it's just gonna be interesting to see how employers think about talent retention and, and, and linking that to flexibility. Because I think that people are gonna have more choice now than they have before to find flexible work. So it's gonna be interesting to see what happens with women and parents in terms of where they go. And I very much agree with Lenore. I think some industries or sectors are, are not gonna to wanna to make a shift. Um, and they'll be willing to lose certain demographics um, and not offer flexibility. Um, but I think there's gonna be a lot pay attention um, to where does flexibility exist if that's important to them during their search. So in terms of moms, we know that almost half of moms who've built successful careers end up leaving the workforce for a period of time to raise kids. Um, I don't want to opt out of the workforce but they want to be able to manage their own time and really jump in and go all in um, 
at work? Am I freezing or am I, am I okay getting internet kicked back? They want to be able to go all in at work when that's what needs to happen. And then they want to be able to shift back to home or their kids' school um, when those moments are important. And I think many of them are really looking for a model where success is assessed by outcomes and by your ability to meet deadline and deadlines and not so much about just face time in the office and how many hours are you in your seat for a given day. And there's also been a lot of positive impacts for dads, the flexibility during the pandemics. Um, dads, it's been a, re, you know reported pretty widely about dads just being happy to have those mornings and those evenings with kids. And many dads don't want to shift back to that. So I think it's just going to be sort of interesting to see how many more workplaces are offering flexibility as more people are really on board that they want that. So for individual job seekers where flexibility is important to you, um, I think things are gonna be different in the past. I think what's really unique about this moment is that I think time they were negotiating, but it can be easy when an offer comes in to be relieved that you got the job and that you got the flexibility conversation. But I think what job seekers really have going for them right now is more people than ever before are going to be asking for flexibility. I always encourage my clients um, when that salary offer comes in and you're also talking about flexibility, it's not a substitution for being paid what you're worth. It's a benefit in addition to your paycheck. And that benefit is telling you something about the culture. If it's, um, so I think if you want flexibility, it's a great time to go out and get it. So those are my thoughts. Uh, Sash, can I ask a quick question? Um, yeah. When do you think this flexibility, like when will this transition settle in? And is it like a year or is it like 10 years? Do you have a sense from your clients? Like how long are we going to be flexing to where flexible, I guess? You mean until it sort of takes hold in a more mainstream kind of way? Right. Yeah. So I think it's going to depend. Um, like I said, some companies at the beginning of the pandemic already announced to their employees, you don't ever have to come back full time. In fact, you can't. We're getting rid of our offices, right? right? Other folks, um, once vaccinations started, were like, you have to be back here five days a week. So right. I think it's going to take a year, two years, three years to really see just because I think some employers are going to start out by saying, no, our culture is about FaceTime and we really want you here four or five days a week. But I think it's going to be interesting to see who leaves and who shuffles around, particularly as we go through this great resignation to then see what does the new normal look like? Personally, I think that's going to take a while. I don't think we're going to know that right away. Um, I think it's a few years, but I do think it's going to be better than it was before in terms of flexibility. I would agree. I, um, I have some uh, CEOs that I'm working with where they find they can't recruit talent because they don't have the flexibility. So it was only as they were growing again that they realized that the dictatorial way of doing it wasn't working because they couldn't get new people. Right. And right. I think it's also going to be really interesting as people move to hybrid models to really think about what needs to be done in person. Mm. And then where can you just let people have a little bit more freedom and they actually do better work under those conditions. More so freedom. I think that's going to be an interesting question. Yeah, for leaders. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Sasha. All right, Mandy, let's bring it home. What do you got for us? Yeah, I mean, I've been really fascinated with the great resignation. Um, obviously, the clients that I work with are in the process of either leaving jobs or looking for jobs. So, you know, I did a little research to see like, okay, is this just my imagination? Is this just my LinkedIn feed <laughs> that's telling me that this is happening? And some of the statistics, there's an article that came out in the Harvard Business Review like a couple of weeks ago, basically showing that in for example, like in July of 2021, 4 million people resigned from their jobs. Sounds like a lot. Um, I dug a little deeper to see like, okay, but how does that compare to like pre-pandemic? It's about a 15% increase. So it's not our imagination. It really is happening. Um, and they basically list like four main reasons for why people are resigning. And I don't think this will be any surprise, um, but I'll go through that quickly 
to show you why you as a job seeker actually have leverage in this context. Um, so first off, you know, there's been a backlog, right? So people have been wanting to quit, they've been frustrated, but have kind of been like holding on because they're like, well, I don't want to quit in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> like now that we're kind of, I guess, at the third wave of the pandemic, people are like, all right, it's time. <laughs> I'm giving it my resignation. Second is burnout, right? So a lot of companies went on hiring freezes or they cut down, um, they eliminated staff. And so the people that were left had to do probably twice as much work for the same amount of pay and they're just tired and they're sick of it. So they're quitting. Um, the third is categorized as like an epiphany, right? So you just, you're like, wait a minute, global pandemic, literally 700,000 people have died. Why am I a project manager? <laughs> like, I, I, wanna, I wanna live in Montana. Like, what am I doing with my life, right? Um, and the fourth is more tactical, which is like people just, you know, they have an aversion to offices. They're like, wait, I don't have to commute 90 minutes every day. Like, why am I wasting my time? I don't want to go back to the office. So for those reasons, we are seeing like a, a real and marked increase in people resigning. And so for you as a job seeker, either if you're resigning or actively looking for a job, I think what that means is when you were in the position where the job offer, as Sasha mentioned, like when the job offer comes through, right? It lands in your lap. Sometimes I think a, a previous posture would have been to say, let me, let me not ask for too much, right? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to have them rescind the offer or I don't want to come off as greedy. It's like, now is the time, <laughs> like ask for what you're worth, ask for more money than you think you need. Like, ask for more perks, more benefits, ask for flexibility. Do not be afraid or shy um, because the, the numbers are real. Like people are leaving their, companies are having trouble. There are all these articles now advising HR people on how to retain talent, right? And Eric, it's just like you said, they're, they're like, well, you better have a flexible policy and you better integrate all of these things and you better, you know, uh, be transparent about career trajectories, et cetera. And so I think for, for everyone on the call today, if you're a job seeker, uh, now's the time. <laughs> like, don't be shy, be aggressive, ask for what you want. Um, so uh, Mandy, do you think the great resignation will continue, go up? What do you think? I think it's gonna continue. Yeah. I think, um, so oftentimes as coaches, a question we get is like, what's the cycle? Right. So like we're nearing the holidays. So November, December, yes, typically like things slow down because mm -hmm. on both sides, people are like, oh, traveling the holidays, like it's not really as busy. But I think that um, come January, we're going to hit this kind of nice intersection of new year, new, new start, <laughs> more people are going to quit. Um, and it's, it's going to continue. I think if anything, we're in the middle of it. We're not we're not at the end. Um, one thing I've been thinking a lot about with that is we all learned during COVID to spend less money or spend money on things that were more important because we were limited in where we could spend our money, we could go out to restaurants. So part of why people who are working have more flexibility is because you may not have the, the same salary requirements just to, you know, get the nice clothing and, and have the nice apartment. So the value shift is a money shift, which then drives right to the salary. Totally. Yeah, totally. Yes. Um, okay. So what we're going to do now is we've had, we had some, thank you, Mandy. And thank you, everyone. Uh, we had some questions that were submitted in advance. And so we're going to take a look at that and then I'm going to, I'm going to pepper them around and hopefully uh, all three of you will have different, different perspectives on that. So um, here they come. All right. And I'm going to start with you, Mandy, because I ended with you. All right. Ready for the first one? I need some music, something like that. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay, should those of us who want to negotiate a hybrid work from home working arrangement expect to receive a lower salary? So we, we mentioned that, so let's dig in a little bit on that. Um, okay, so they will try, right? So I think an example that you've probably all read about is Google. Um, so Google has actually published internally to their employees uh, it's literally like a spreadsheet where like, oh, if if you were working in, you know, the Mountain View headquarters and now you decide to move to North Dakota, 
guess what? You're going to take this percentage of a pay cut. So I think the for everyone to just be aware that companies are trying to make you pay for that. Um, but I think that it's important that you advocate for yourself, right? In any situation, you still, you're not going to get it if you don't ask for it. So don't go in with the posture of like, oh, well, I, I guess I should expect like, I'm going to work remote. So it'll be less money. Like as Sasha said, it's not, it doesn't mean you take a pay cut. Um, right. Unfortunately, like the big tech companies are setting, in my opinion, a bad example. Um, but I think that will hurt them in the long run. So, so just to say that uh, it's, it's a paradigm shift around what is the value of being in the office versus being flexible. So it might take some time for organizations to understand like that, f that flexibility doesn't mean a reduced value. It might be an increased value. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, Sasha, what are the best resources to understand compensation for a particular role within a particular industry, both all in comp and the composition or components of the comp? In a particular industry? Yeah, so another, I think the question is, is how do I figure out how much is a reasonable compensation in any given industry? Or how to think about that? I, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what other people on the panel say too, but I mean, I think you have to do your research. So where can you find that information for your industry? Um, you know, trying to get as much information as you can upfront about the total compensation, certainly the salary, but what's the matching 401k? Is there life insurance? Are there bonuses? Really, really understanding that. So I think the, the best sources of information really vary by industry and by sector. Mm -hmm. um, I think I always advise my clients when they're in an industry and they don't they don't know something, go out, talk to your peers who are in that industry, have really specific and detailed information to give you. Um, but yeah, it's always good to do your homework. Mm, good. Anyone else have a website or, for example, I usually look on Glass. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lenore. I was going to say, I have used salary.com in the past, but this is where you want to talk with someone who has expertise in your industry. So I will regularly um, talk with clients about, again, I, I'm going to be a little bit of a, um, a different perspective on this issue of geography. Mm -hmm. um, and again, maybe that is because I've been a hiring manager. And so I know what it means to hire people. But if someone is living in Pittsburgh, their cost of living is considerably lower than someone who's in New York City. And they are going to be paid commensurate with where they live. Why? Because that's actually why I might be hiring them to pay them a lower cost, knowing that they're talented. So I, I'm, um, I'm not saying I love what Mandy said about advocating for yourself. Uh, but I think you really need to know your worth, the company, and the industry, so that you have appropriate benchmarks, and you can um, negotiate accordingly. Because otherwise, you're either going to leave too much money on the table, or price yourself out of something where if you get to work from home, that is an advantage. So I believe that is something that's a benefit that I actually do always say to people, if you can't get the salary, then you ask for that work from home if that's a requirement, right? Mm -hmm. But if you go in for a job and they need you to work in the office, that's an expectation too. So you, you know, to me, this is, there aren't like hard and fast rules. Right. So I think, Lenore, it's interesting what you're saying, which is that's a, you know, like say that's an employer perspective, which is important. And for example, if I pay, pay the person in Pittsburgh the same as I pay the person in New York, essentially the pay person in Pittsburgh is making more money because yeah. the cost of living is lower. And that's unfair, let's say, in reverse. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, so let's just put yeah. it in the employer's perspective, which is they have to manage to a budget. And if there's a skill set they need that they can get for $50,000, why would they pay $80,000 unless 
the $80,000 person really is bringing much more to the table. So, so unfortunately, the downside of um, having a market now where anyone can work from anywhere is that we're competing with everyone all over the place, right? I go on Upwork and I hire talent where I can pay them $20 an hour instead of $50 an hour. That is the reality of our market right now. So I think there are um, just things to be aware of in whatever your unique situation is um, that you go into any situation really informed knowing your worth and what you're applying for. Uh, Mandy, Sasha, want to add to that? Anything? Yeah. I was just going to also say Glassdoor as like an initial baseline resource. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also, within Glassdoor, you can filter by city or keyword or like actual title for what you'd be going for. It's not like always 100% accurate, but it's a good starting point. Um, and then I would just add that if you have someone who's referred you to the company, let's say it's like a friend or a former colleague, um, don't be shy about asking them like, hey, do you know kind of what the range might be? They might have some information that they can share with you. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, Lenore, you're next up, ready? Are you ready? Um, I still need my music, but I'm not getting it, but fine. Okay, uh, thanks for your comment on salary. I was wondering if you have any advice on how to answer when HR asks about a salary range, since it's been made illegal in many states, to flat out ask for current salary. I want to get more than my current salary, but I'm also afraid for asking too high. So for example, I know in New York, you're not allowed to ask someone what their current salary is. So yeah, you, yes. I, I think um, a great way to approach that is for you to know for yourself, what is your baseline? What is the minimum amount that you are gonna accept? So if you are looking for a new job and you will not take less than $150,000, that is your bottom range. And if you really want to get an increase, I'm not great with the math, I'm gonna have to pull out my calculator. Let's just say you put a 20% premium on that, if that's what you believe um, the position is worth. Sorry, I gotta do my math here. So 150,000 times 1.2. So 150 to 180, right? If that was the range. Now you wanna be clear when you're stating if they're asking for salary or if they're asking all in. Right, so certain com you know certain businesses they'll give you um, a bonus. Maybe that's ten percent or whatever. So you want to make sure that when you're answering, you're answering in kind with what it is your expectation is. So, for example, financial service folks would want to say, "I'm looking for a base." You know, I'm either looking for base in the range of X to Y or all in base bonus options around this range. And then that could be a significantly larger range. Okay, that's good, thank you. Um, all right, Amanda, you're next. Which are some- Can I add? Yes, go for it. Yeah, so on that last question, um, my take on that is also just from a negotiation perspective. I think the first round, I would encourage people not to answer the question, but instead to ask a question in return of, well, what's the salary and total compensation for the role? I'd love to start the discussion there. I think if they come back and ask again, particularly when it is illegal, I would actually try to dodge again. And I've seen people successfully be able to steer the conversation away just because sometimes you don't know if the bottom of the range is 120 or if it's 160. So it can be hard. Um, so I recommend trying to negotiate the flow of the conversation. So what's interesting about that, Sasha, is like avoiding the part of it that's illegal or wrong. Like that's not the point. The point is, is you're gonna play the game, answer a question with a question to get, to get clearer framing. So don't get wrapped up in the fact that maybe they've asked the wrong question. I think what's tricky right. though, is that there are online forms now. And so when you apply, they expect you to fill in a number and they won't let you proceed unless you've done that. So, you know, right. you can either, you know, come up with a high range and then, or put it's negotiable or, you know, 
I, I love what Sasha is saying. And you would always want to communicate the message. I'm looking for the best fit for me. So I want to hear what the range is. And, and hopefully if this is a fit, we'll come to a great agreement on what makes sense for both of us. So uh, here I'm going to make a little plug for the Career Coaching Network. This is the most difficult conversation you're going to have. And if you think that you're just going to be able to pull all that alone to by yourself to figure that out, now, it's really hard. This is one of the things that us coaches work with people on all the time, which has a direct value to you because it helps you negotiate better. So this is something that's scary and it's intense and having an expert help you think about all these variables gets a better result. I dare I did that. There I said it. Yeah, I was going to just add on that, Eric. And yeah. um, it isn't enough about it's not only about the number. It's yeah. about your attitude, which was kind of what Sasha alluded to. It's right. like, are you going to bring your game face? Are you ready to play? Because this is a game and you want to show up and you want to be in a position of strength that you know your worth and you're asking for it and you're standing in your power. And if you got that down, you got right. it made. I've actually seen a CEO re regret hiring someone because they took the first offer. And then he thought, uh oh, they're not a good negotiator and they're not going to negotiate well for me now. I do you want to share a personal story though? So I am speaking from real experience. I went back to a potential employer after I had somewhat accepted an offer to negotiate on the salary and they withdrew the offer. So I'm speaking from personal experience. It sucked, but ultimately it was the, um, the right thing because I had had questions and that was why I pushed back. And then the CEO didn't like that I pushed back and, you know, ultimately it was for the best, but you need to be very smart and strategic about how you approach these things because you don't want to piss off the person who is um, going to employ you. And you don't want to ask for too much at the wrong time, because that can be damaging in the negotiation as well. Yeah, it is definitely an art. Um, thank you. Okay, uh, Mandy, which are some of the most attractive companies that you see people interested in or where you recommend clients target? It varies so much. I mean, there's the obvious ones, right? Like fangs and big tech. And I mean, that's definitely a trend, but I think what I can say on that is um, people are getting smarter. <laughs> it's kind of what I'm noticing, right? So I think like the, the sort of um, certain sexiness and appeal of like companies, people are starting to be in a healthy way skeptical. Mm -hmm. So I've worked with, many clients now who are like, oh yeah, but I don't want to do the whole startup thing. It's too toxic. It's too, uh, there's like no work-life balance. They're going to like take over my life. And I'm always like really proud and like kind of like pleasantly surprised when I hear people have that kind of self-awareness. Right. Um, or even, I mean, even, you know, maybe five years ago, it was like really cool to work at Facebook and Google and all these places. But I think even now people are kind of like, yeah, I mean, I could do that. Or like, maybe I can go work in like crypto, you know? So I think it's, um, it's just such a broad question. I'd love to open it to, uh, to everyone else. But from what I'm seeing, people are kind of wisening up and doing research about not just like the big well-known companies, but about companies that are going to have, you know, the right culture fit for them. And they might not always be like the Fortune 100. Uh, anyone want to add to that one? I, I have a thought. Oh, go ahead. But go ahead, Sasha, go first. Well, I just echo what Mandy said. I think it's really hard to answer that question without knowing the person who's asked it because it's so personal in terms of what you want out of your work, mm -hmm. your industry, what you're looking for in the culture. So, you know, I think when people want diversity, they're looking at a, at a culture and what are they doing around diversity and are they walking the talk? Um, but it's it's hard to answer that at least for me, just out of the blue. I think it depends on the job seeker and what they want. So yeah, go ahead, Lenore. Well, I was just gonna say, I'm also a career advisor at Bard's MBA for sustainability. Um, almost every single one of those graduates is getting a job. 
sustainability is a very um, high growth area where there are not only incredible needs, but it's a growing awareness along with all these other cultural shifts, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, sustainability, governance, um, justice. So all of these areas um, the culture is shifting, thankfully, and organizations are realizing they have to come up the curve. So if those are areas that you have an interest in or you have some expertise in that you can transfer um, either within your existing company to make a move or to try and um, reposition yourself, I think that's a growing area where um, the world is in need of people that can carry that torch. Um, so I would thank you. I was going to add to that, which is when I graduated Columbia, it was all about brand name. It was like, we're going to work at Goldman Sachs or Bain. It was the two. If you didn't get either of those two, it was nothing. And it feels like what we're all, we're all telling you is like, almost like the power of brand name is less, but like Lenore, what you're saying is something that's purpose-driven might be something that people are driving towards, but maybe you know, the brand name idea plus what happens really inside of a brand name company can be totally different. I mean, the only other thing I would add is more people are hanging up their own shingle. So if you have an idea, Shark Tank, I mean, go for it. Like if you can take that risk, right, and you're willing to take a leap. And I think until more recently, there was a lot of hesitancy, right, to kind of go out on your own. But I think more and more people are realizing that they should have a side hustle or maybe they can turn their hobby and passion into something that they earn income from. So if that's something that's appealing to you, now is a great time. The technology is supporting it. And um, that might be another avenue that perhaps you wouldn't have considered before, but might make sense now. Excellent. Okay, Sasha, are you ready for the next question? Okay, what would you say to someone who wants to break out of a professional profile? So that means like, I think the way I'm reading it is like, I'm a lawyer and I don't wanna be a lawyer anymore. I am a doctor and I don't wanna be a doctor anymore. Yeah, um, it's a great question. So I think that sometimes when folks are in that mindset, they're very wedded to the things that they do. I do these sets of things, but I think it's really about stepping back and getting very clear on what are your transferable skills. Things like being organized, things like having good relationship building skills, being able to build relationships with lots of different people, being strategic, being a good communicator. It's really about being able to tell your story in a way that shows how you can take what you've done now your interests have shifted. You're interested in this new thing for a reason and you know something about it. And here's how you want to apply your experience. And I think what, support, what, what supports us in the environment around that is a lot of people have multiple careers now. It's not you know, 50 years ago where that's unheard of. And I think it's scary at the beginning of that. Um, but the more you get clear on what you have to offer and tell your story in a compelling way, you can open those doors. Um. So, so would you say culturally there's it's the ability to just change, it's more okay? I do, and I always tell my clients, you know, there's things you can control in your search and there's things you can't control. So I recommend focusing on the things you can control. So one of the, thi one of the things you can control is knowing what you're good at and how you talk about it. So it's very clear. Mm -hmm. You can't control whether the interviewer is open to that or not, or if they have you in a box, doctor, lawyer. But eventually, if you have an able to say, you have a really interesting background. I see how what you're bringing is unique and is going to make a contribution here. So I think I know it's hard not to get discouraged, but not getting discouraged um, when people aren't opening the door right away. You're going to meet that person who does. Right. Uh, excellent. OK, I think, Mandy, you're up. You ready? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Well, first of all, someone added in the chat that for tech comp, levels.fyi and candor.io are good places to look. So we're being interactive. We've got everyone joining us, helping us together. It's amazing. Okay. I have taken time to return home and help my mother and family while strengthening my health for whatever career field is next. How should I approach questions about the gap? 
not the retail store. That was funny. Um, <laughs> <I wasn't. laughs> so I think this is the, the question, the great question, the gap, right? Which people worry about all the time. So I think that's kind of like the, the main question. I'm sure we can all have an opinion on the gap. So what do you think, Mandy? Yeah, so great question. Um, I think there's, there's two levels to this. So the first is gonna be when someone hasn't met you and you're just on a piece of paper. So how do you address that gap? And then the second part, which is gonna be the easier part is when you're in conversation, in an interview, in a screening call, someone says, what happened here? Although nowadays, I think there's less questioning of like life changing, altering things, but how you, how you approach that in conversation. So let's take the first one, which is more tactical. Um, taking time. Okay. So what I would ask is like how much time, if it's less than a year, I mean, there's like an easy trick on your resume where you don't necessarily have to list the months. And so they, there may not be such a visible gap. Like if it's six months or eight months, like you probably don't have to list it on your resume. Um, if it's a, a longer gap, like you've taken several years off to stay at home or you were traveling or, you know, went on sabbatical, um, oftentimes you can put that on your resume as well if you feel that it's substantial enough. Um, and I, I like to keep it in kind of the same formatting that you would treat everything else just so that you can chronologically see, oh, okay, so between you know, 2018 and 2020, this is what they were doing. And don't, uh, don't elaborate too much on it. You don't need like a ton of detail, maybe like one bullet point, two bullet points, you know. Uh, but most people honestly aren't going to care that much about it. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of how you might talk about it, right? Like in an interview, um, I want to hear other people's approaches because my approach is going to be very human, which is to say, say it like you explained it, right? Like you went to help your mother, like that in itself is like, oh, I totally get it. Mm -hmm. um, and just what I would say is practice, practice how you say it and try to say it in, in a couple different ways and see what feels comfortable to you. So what I would say is start with the craziest, most long-winded version that you can just get it all out. Say like, say it crazy, right? Say the whole like dramatic okay. story and then gradually try iterative versions that are less and less uh, imbued with detail, such that at the end you might, you might land on like the 30% version, which shows enough emotion and enough kind of like, yeah, some shit went down, right? Mm -hmm. But also kind of not dragging people into like, you know, the emotional mm -hmm. weight of, of whatever might've happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and try those versions until you land on something that feels both authentic to you and professionally appropriate, short and sweet. Excellent. And for example, Mandy, practice with your coach. Right? Practice with Mandy. your coach. That's what we're here for. I want right. to hear those versions. Do some reps. So, Sasha, what do you think about the gap? I'm going to uh, take a page out of Lenore's book and talk about a gap personally. And um, it's very much, you know, also what Mandy said. I was out of work for two years when I had my first child. And the long, crazy version was, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? And I graduated from Columbia a few years ago. I was on a path and tears and blah, blah, blah. And what, what the story became was I had my child. I knew I wanted to spend two years with her as though I were in total control of everything that happened. And I did. And then when she was two, I went back to work. She was tied up with a bow. <laughs> and people, people really didn't care. It made sense. Mm -hmm. And they were hiring me for all of my work experience before that time. And it was just a sentence. People are like, oh, right, you want to be with your kid, now you're back. Okay. The gap, at, particularly for people who go to Columbia <laughs> and that high achieving, it's very stressful. I'm not on my path. Everything's not lined up. It doesn't have to be all perfect and lined up. It can just be good and your life and people go through different twists and turns and it's okay. Excellent. Okay, Lenore, what about, go. Yeah. Um, well, so I think, you know, everyone's situation is unique, but I think if there's something you can pull out of what you gained during that period of time, highlight that if you have, if you're unemployed and you're struggling to find 
full-time employment, I would highly recommend that you consider volunteering or getting involved in some other organization because to me, that is legitimate work experience. So I had a client who um, had to go home. She was living in New York, loved it, was in a certain industry. She had to take care of her family business because her father had cancer, right? You got to do what you got to do. But she was running a store, you know, like a, a food business. I'm like, I don't see that on your resume. That was two years. You were managing the marketing, customer service. Like that was work experience. So I think there are ways to message and communicate that and also convey who you are as a person that you show up and do what is the right thing and what you need to do. And if you're still soul searching and discovering things like that's okay. A lot of us are multi-passionate. That becomes a different challenge because that's more about how do you weave a story together from all of your disparate interests that you then reposition yourself in this new way. And that's doable too, but that takes a little time to find the through line. Um, so it's interesting as we got two questions based on our question, which is how would I explain that I got laid off as a gap or what if the gap is due to burnout? What I would first say though is the principles are exactly still the same, which is, right? Go ahead, Lenore, say. Yeah, what I was going to say, what I, what I forgot to add was yeah. Um, the most important thing in whatever you're communicating is that you yourself are clearly resolved in how you feel about it and the choices that you made. So just like Sasha was alluding to, the way we feel emotionally and the guilt and the anxiety and the stress and the concern, that is not a helpful or productive energy to translate into your communication style. So once you're clear that you've worked through why you made the choices and what happened, you got laid off. Okay. It wasn't, the, it wasn't a good fit. It wasn't the right company. I was in the wrong role. Like whatever it is, sort that shit out as, you know, like, let's just be real. You got to know yourself, get through it. And then you come to a place where you can communicate it with um, empathy and confidence. Well, that was not the right fit. I had a challenge. Um, it wasn't the right environment. I needed to take time off for myself to get clear on my next step. Like there are many ways you can tell that. That doesn't always translate as easily in the resume. So that's the part that needs to be nuanced and, and communicated just like your LinkedIn profile, but it can be done. Excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna say, this is some homework for all of you, which is we just went through a 15 month change. You wanna to start to work on what is your COVID experience to explain. Whether you had a job, left your job, got laid off, you know, climbed the Andes. So you can start to think now to some reflection to be able to turn that long story into something that makes sense. Now, but I, uh, we're getting too close to the hour. So what I want each of the coaches to do is think about like what is sort of one sort of overarching thought or advice or everything we talked about around going through this transition period that we're going through and your opportunity to navigate your career. So I don't know, Mandy, from something you heard or something you said, like what do you think that um, all of our participants can really uh, get their head around to start to think more about. Yeah. There is the internal work that you have to do, right? So I'm burned out. What does that mean? I took time off. What does that mean? I helped my mom. What does that mean? And that's messy and that's deep. And that's you sitting and crying and writing in a journal or going for a run. I mean, that is you working through that emotion. That's the internal work that you have to do, right? And then there's the external story. And there is a path. You have to walk through the internal stuff before you can bridge over and tell a beautiful, clean, pretty story that some HR manager is going to like eat up, <laughs> right? So I would encourage you to just understand that distinction. Mm -hmm. Internal work first, then tell a pretty story. And the only thing I'd add to that is, and nowadays the story can be even a little messy. 
can be a little messy and that that's relatable. Right. And because the person on the other side you're telling it to went through the same crazy stuff that you did. Yeah. Also has yeah. toddlers in the background. Like <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. Uh, Sasha, what's your like, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I really love how Mandy phrased that, the internal and the external. Um, and I, so I think similarly, it's getting clear, know what you want, know what you want. We've been through a crazy time. A lot of people have had realizations. People have had loss. People have realized life is short. I want to spend my time well. So know what you want. And in your power, it's okay, which practice, practice asking for it so that by the time you get to that conversation, it's easier because you should ask for what you want and get more comfortable doing that. Excellent. Okay, Lenore. Um, similar to what Sasha is saying, I believe you have to know yourself. And I think that happens on three levels. First, it's what are you good at? Those are your strengths. Then it's what do you really like to do? Those are your preferences. Then we get to your values. What do you care about? So when you take the intersection of those three things and you look at the opportunities that are out there, that's what we call your sweet spot. So that's where you want to play. And the more honest you can be with yourself about what it is that's most important to you, then you're going to have a better chance of finding it versus like trying to do all these things that you think you should be doing or worrying about what other people are doing, because that's going to take you away from yourself. So the more you can hone in with what is true for you, the, um, the easier it's going to be to find something that really aligns with, um, with you and will be the best fit. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that adds to everything you guys are saying, which is there's this thing called Ikigai, which is a Japanese philosophy based on an island in Okinawa where people live longer than anywhere else in the world. And part of their philosophy is what Lenore and Sasha and Mandy were saying, which is if you know yourself and you know what's important to you and you know what you value and you know what you're good at, you can go along the long life journey searching, seeking for those things. And if you do that, then the notion even of retirement doesn't make sense because it's not you're gonna do all that and then just stop and sit around, right? So really what we're all telling you is, and I think at the deepest level is, now is an amazing time to get to know yourself. You had 15 months at least to get to know yourself. Then once you know yourself and what you like, you give yourself permission to go out into the world with the support of a, a strong network and a coach to start to get and ask for it. And the more of us that ask for it and the more of us that give it, we will have more people who wanna give it to other people, okay? So not only when you do it for yourself, do you do it for yourself, but you do it for the person that you ask it from because then they say, maybe I should ask for it for myself too. So you spread the love when you do that. Um, okay, I wanna say thank you to all my coaches and for taking this time for sharing your insights, for your, for your joy and for your work that you bring into the world. I think it is our time now to share our gifts with the world, which we are doing in every which way that we can, and to let the world and to all of you to evolve in your careers and in your lives, and they should be long and healthy and happy. And that's all we got for you. So thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Thank Eric. you. All right. Take Thank care. Thank you. Thank you.